Yes. Okay, so now officially welcome everyone. Very nice to have you in today's session. Uh, my name is Anna Brooks and together with Laura Pape, we will be hosting today's session. We are both uh, PhD candidates within the BioClock Consortium. Uh, and this consortium is a Dutch uh, research project uh, in which we examine the biological clock uh, in different uh, scenarios. So mm -hmm. in society, in human health and in ecosystems. And so the uh, BioClock Consortium also organizes these monthly uh, BioClock Academy sessions. Uh, this is a lecture series um, really meant for everyone with an interest in uh, bio um, chronobiology, but especially the early career uh, researchers. So we really aim to introduce you to basic concepts and equip you with the proper knowledge uh, from um, experts in the field. And if these experts want, they can also give some um, background about their personal career story. Uh, these sessions are held every uh, third Wednesday of the month. Uh, today's session will be about approximately 40 minute talk and then 50 minutes of discussion. Um, and you can ask questions, but during the talk, please put them in the chat and then afterwards we can uh, get back to them. So that was the general introduction, and then Laura will introduce you to the speaker. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, we are very honored to welcome today a new speaker. Our guest is uh, Professor Dr. John Hoganesh, who is joining us all the way from the US, Cincinnati today. And Professor Hoganesh is a genome and circadian biologist and professor at the UC Department of Pediatrics. Uh, the primary focus of his work has been research on the network of mammalian clock genes to understand circadian behavior. And he has made numerous contributions to understanding the core clock mechanisms. And in his lab at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, He's applying the principles of circadian biology to hospital medicine. And also that's what today's talk will be focusing on, building circadian medicine in a pediatric, pediatric hospital. So I don't, don't want to spoil everything, but the, the floor is yours. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you a little bit today about the circadian oscillator, the system then how most of everything that we do in a hospital is rhythmic, how when you do uh, certain procedures like dosing medications actually matters, how we're pursuing a circadian medicine, which I like better than chronotherapy um, for reasons that we can get into, with our buildings, our electronic medical rec record system, and with our patients with uh, in many cases, unrecognized circadian disorders. And finally, how we're learning about the molecular oscillator from our patients. So our field got its start in the late 1960s, early 1970s, due to the pioneering efforts of this man, which is uh, Seymour Benzer, um, who was working with a graduate student, Ron Kanapka. And in the late 1960s, uh, early 1970s, and they had a heretical idea at the time, and that was that uh, genes shaped behavior. So at the time, it was the 60s, there was very much the idea that the environment shaped the individual. And they had this a contrary hypothesis, which is that uh, some of your innate behavior, at least some of it, was wired and uh, determined by your DNA. And so they did a screen in flies looking for flies that got up a little bit earlier every day. Um, we'll call those early type flies. And Laura, you're the only one I can see. So I'm gonna do the poll. Raise your hand if you're an early person. I'm not either. Personally, I find them annoying. Um, they also found flies that were late types. So raise your hand if you'd like to stay out later. Yes, I like, to, I like to party with you cowboys. And they even found flies that were completely arrhythmic. And when they did the genetics, they figured out that all three phenotypes mapped to the same locus in Drosophila, and they called that locus the period locus. But because of the state of molecular genetics in 1970, it wasn't possible to clone the actual gene. And it took about 14, 15 years for the Hall, Ross, Bosch, and Young labs 
to actually clone the Per Locusts, and it was one of the founding members of the Per Art Sim past domain transcription factor family, and that really helped helped the field of behavioral genetics really uh, really flourish. So this is an, uh, the way that most people learn about rhythms, and that is they have a baby. And so this is a uh, actigraphy uh, graph. So every time a baby is active, they're moving, the bars are light, and every time they're inactive, the bars are dark. And so this is a human infant from age three weeks to age 26 weeks. And what you can see is that the beginning of this particular infant's life or most infants' lives, they're almost completely arrhythmic. And then you can see the emergence of this long period ultradian rhythm starting around week six or seven. And then at week 17 or so, you can see this particular infant is slapping into a, a circadian rhythm where they're getting up at, at about uh, eight to 10 a.m. in the morning and they're going to bed at eight to 10 p.m. at night. And so my colleague at Penn, Maya Buchan and I turned this into a greeting card where um, uh, whenever somebody in the lab has a baby, I print a copy of it out and I write, uh, you are here after three or four weeks. And this is when life becomes livable at week 17 or 18 or so. And I've already been to multiple talks in the last year where I've sent these cards to people in the field and, and they printed them out and they put them in their office and uh, their spouses, their wives, their husbands have said, thank you for reminding us that it's, uh, it, it's a temporary phase and it, it will end. Um, so, uh, and if it didn't, uh, there's, a, there's another remarkable part of this, which is that your memory doesn't work very well when you're sleep deprived. So you forget how horrible it was to have an infant and then a couple of years later, you have another one. And if you didn't uh, didn't have that, you, we, our species would probably be doomed. It's not just people, uh, human infants that have rhythms. It turns out that most organisms on the planet have them, plants, uh, insects, uh, uh, birds, bees, Charles Darwin here, mice, we all have circadian rhythms. It's not that every single organism has them, the northernmost mammal on the planet, the Arctic reindeer, um, does not does not apparently have a strong circadian system. They have a very strong seasonal clock, but they don't have a strong uh, circadian clock. And that, that could be because prey species need to be alert at all times, um, just in case they're, they're gonna get predated on by a wolf or what have you. And, and it, it may be an adaptive advantage. This is why most students and postdocs care, and that is the, because it, it's not just the circadian system, but also your sleep homeostat interacts. And so this is a slide courtesy of Till Ronenberg looking at sleep duration in uh, children from age 15 or so all the way to adults uh, of age 80. And what you can see is in general, when you're younger in your 20s and 30s, you need about an hour or more of sleep than you're actually getting on your work or school days. So when you when you hit the weekends, typically you're 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 sleeping longer. And I have every intention of doing so come Saturday. It's not just behavior and sleep, it's also all this other ancillary physiology. So before you even wake up, your blood pressure begins to rise. You have a circadian oscillation in your core body temperature, many plasma hormones, lung function, skeletal muscle function. All of these physiological systems have very strong circadian components. Here's an example. This is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So this is when you don't just go in an office, but you actually wear a cuff over a period of two days. And this is actually my blood pressure about 10 years ago, when my uh, now 15 year olds were four and a half years old, um, looking at uh, my blood pressure every uh, 20 minutes during the day 
and every 30 minutes at night over two straight days. And what you can see is that at the time I was slightly high, 140 over 90. Um, now that would be a post sprint that would be uh, considered hypertensive. Um, I've, I've been taking uh, antihypertensives for 10 years. So thank you very much for inquiring about my health. I'm doing very well. Thank you. And I appreciate your concern. Um, so that was the bad news. The good news was uh, my blood pressure dips at night. And it turns out that um, about one third of hypertensives have non-dipping hypertension. So sometimes this can be accompanied by things like obstructive sleep apnea, other medical conditions that don't let your blood pressure drop. And it turns out that this group of people, uh, the over 50, over 55 crowd with non-dipping hypertension has much worse outcomes than dipping hypertensives like myself. So um, if you're a non-dipping female, your chances of dying over a 10 year period post age 55 is about four times higher than if you're a dipping hypertensive. And if you're a male, your chance of dying is about twice as high if you're a non-dipping hypertensive. So the good news is um, that I think that this phenotype, non-dipping hypertension, is going to be uh, more easily accessible in the future as new technologies come on to monitor blood pressure over time. We already have good technology. It's the gold standard ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And um, there's no reason why we can't do better in terms of heart attack and stroke. All of this biology emerges from the circadian system, um, which is a group of molecules, including uh, BMAL1, which is a gene I discovered, and CLOCK, which was discovered by Joe Takahashi and its paralog and POS2, which are BHLH POS domain containing transcription factors. Now, CLOCK and BMAL bind E boxes throughout the genome, but notably in the promoters of the period and cryptochrome genes, where uh, they activate transcription, initiating mRNA uh, translation in the cytoplasm. The per and cry proteins are actively imported into the nucleus as a heterodimer. And eventually they reach sufficient concentration where they pull clock and female off of DNA and repress their transcription. And then later in the cycle, the clock and female heterodimer can hop back on DNA as the per and cry proteins are degraded by E3 ligases, and that lets clock and, and BMAL initiate another round of transcription. So this is what we call the core oscillator. If you get rid of BMAL, you break the clock. That's the only required component of the oscillator. If you get rid of clock and its paralog and POS2, you break the clock. If you get rid of PER1 and PER2, you break the clock. If you get rid of CRY1 and CRY2, you break the clock. Pretty much every other gene in the genome is dispensable, but this set of genes is not dispensable. Clocks are uh, not precise, so they're biological clocks. They're not like the clock on your wrist or your iPhone, which is reset every day. They're, they're inherently imprecise. They run with you know, anywhere between a few minutes to, to tens of minutes off. And so every day they're reset by light cues. Light is transmitted through the retina, through the retinohypothalamic tract, down to a small set of molecules in the SCN, uh, SCN neurons and glial cells, inside of which uh, runs this, this core molecular oscillator that's present in all cells in your body. That was a big, that was a big shock when Schibler and his colleagues showed in, in the uh, late 90s that the clock was operational basically throughout the body. So at this point, I like the audiences to take out their phones. I'm gonna take out my phone and I'm gonna go into my settings. And I'm gonna go looking for night shift mode, night shift mode. And I have mine set from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. where uh, it, tur it turns out 
uh, tunes out some of the bluish settings. It turns out that, that your light system is most sensitive to bluish light. And, um, and it, it makes the phone look more sepia. And that might get you four or five more extra minutes of sleep at night. Um, you really shouldn't be using your phone at night. Um, and and uh, I don't recommend it. But if, if you're going to, which, come on, you know you do, uh, maybe turn that on and get, get a few minutes extra sleep. This is probably the most important thing you're going to learn during the talk. Uh, hopefully you already knew that. But if you didn't know it, um, you can tune out, uh, tune into Instagram or whatever you guys are doing in Holland. I have no idea. All right. I'm going to tell you a few vignettes, one of which is that virtually everything we do in hospital systems is rhythmic. This is work by Mark Rubin, who's currently in, um, in Venice uh, with his wife, Larissa. They just sent me a text. Um, Yuping Guo, who's a, um, a bioinformatician here at Children's Hospital. Amy Shaw, who's a, a hypertension specialist. Ted Cooper, who's an intensivist. And Dave Smith, who's in the office next to me, and he's a sleep-boarded otolaryngologist. So about six or seven years ago, I first got to Children's, and I was wondering when medications were prescribed in the hospital. And so we wrote an IRB, an institutional review board protocol, um, getting us access to uh, prescription habits of the 10 or 12 most most commonly prescribed uh, medications in the hospital. And when we did that, we started looking at the data and uh, we had held a poll in lab meeting and both Dave and I thought that most drugs would be prescribed in a circadian manner and the rest of the lab thought it would be more or less uh, happening at, at all particular times. But when we looked at hydralazine, we saw that there was a spike of orders between the uh, 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Um, time frame, and then again between four and six. And then there was a spike of administrations of those orders between uh, 8 a.m., for example, and 10 a.m. and four and six p.m. So that's the top panel and the bottom panel, uh, respectively. We decided to look at all 12 drugs, and we found that it wasn't just antihypertensives. It turned out that pretty much every medication in the hospital is given in, in this sort of fashion. And it corresponds to uh, this Western medicine phenomenon called rounding, which is when a, a medical team will go bed by bed, they'll pick up the chart, they'll look at vital signs and such, and they'll make decisions on what, what exactly to do next based, based on, the, on, on, those, on those checkups. And they do that at two times of the day because that's how the hospital operates. And because of that, as a consequence of this cultural phenomenon, um, particularly in academic medical centers of rounding, um, decisions are made at particular times of the day. So most of the time it probably doesn't matter much, but here's two cases where it does matter. On the left-hand side, we have the use of pain medications, morphine and acetaminophen. Tylenol. And on the right hand side, we have the use of vancomycin, which is a last line powerful antibiotic that's used for um, many indications, but amongst which is sepsis. And what you can see is that morphine and acetaminophen on the left hand side are given in the same circadian fashion, peaking in the morning, um, which is kind of problematic because when people most complain about, about pain is when they're trying to go to sleep. So in many cases, it looks like we're under treating sleep in the hospital system. And the upper right-hand side, you know, sleep is one thing. Having a bad night's rest is certainly no, no fun. Um, but even more serious is if, if you have an infection in the hospital, that's one of the few reasons why uh, people actually perish in, in a hospital system. And in this case, we're also seeing diagnosis of sepsis and treatment of sepsis occurring occurring in a um, in a cyclical fashion when it should probably be recognized by signs of infection when when they occur, not not because you're rounded. It's not just the symptoms are occurring in a, in a 
temporal fashion, but also how drugs work is also influenced by when you actually dose them. So this is the use of hydralazine, looking at diastolic and systolic blood pressure um, over time. So our next steps here are to analyze more drugs. We have a current protocol to look at pretty much all drugs in the hospital system. We use somewhere on the order of 2,000 compounds in Western medicine. So it's far beyond, it's far beyond the 12 most common. Um, to go multi-site, multinational and multi-site. I keep saying multi-site. And so I, I definitely want collaborators at Northwestern and Vanderbilt, but I would be equally happy to to work with people in different in different time zones, different countries, to look at how these cultural practices of medicine are uh, inculcating, are influencing the the circadian system, and then also to look by a lot of other uh, cofactors like age, sex, comorbid conditions, uh, as to how that changes both the, the diagnosis of and treatment of different medical disorders. The second bit yet I'm gonna tell you is that when you take your drugs matters, this is work again with Mark, Dave, who's in the office next to me and Garrett, um, who is my former boss at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And so we decided to look at all of the studies on time of day and drug action since uh, 1960 or so. And so we found 106 trials since then. I think we found 140 something where, where people looked at two different or more different times of day. And every time there was an effect of when you give the medication, it's in blue. And every time there's no effect, it's in yellow. And what you can see is that most of the time, about three quarters of the time, uh, when you actually give a medication can influence its effect. Um, and it's in all different medical indications, including hypertension, which I've spoken extensively about, but also cat, uh, cancer, asthma, dyslipidemia, arthritis, um, myocardial injury, this heart attack and stroke, uh, allergy, other, other types of things. And we look for governing principles the, the one governing principle that we found was half-life. If a drug had a long half-life, say longer than 12 hours or so, uh, it's difficult to see how it, it could be influenced by when you take it. Because after several days, it'll reach steady state and you won't have to worry so much about whether you take it or even when you miss a dose, won't really change the concentration of the drug in your system. But if you have a very short half-life, like on the order of uh, a few hours, two, three hours, you can see that there's a very strong uh, impact of when you actually take the medication. And so over the last two decades, in addition to discovering core clock genes like BMAL1, BMAL2, NPOS2, RORA, beta, gamma, uh, KPNB1, which is a nuclear importer, and most recently, Chrono, um, which is another a non-canonical repressor of clock and BMAL. We've also been interested in trying to understand how the clock system rewires the genome to regulate transcription. And so we've done these studies both in mice using kinetic data where we, we, we have, uh, say, five mice per time point every two hours for two days. And we've built an atlas of, I think we're up to like 16 or 17 different mouse tissues where we collected data either from arrays or from RNA sequencing. And then we've actually developed methods to look at human transcription over time. Um, we developed an algorithm, which I'll tell you about. Um, and that's been extremely popular in uh, computational biology because uh, there's apparently at least 15 other groups that have very, very similar, in some cases, nearly identical um, algorithms to look at transcription in humans. So one of the things we noticed was that um, in addition to the, the top line story, 
which is that half the genome is under clock control, both in mice and in humans, is that uh, about half of all drugs hit clock regulated targets, metabolizing enzymes or transporters that are clock regulated. And these drugs are all of the most common and most uh, salient uh, med medical uh, problems in, in biology. Here's, here's a couple here, for example, I'll point out like metoprolol, which is a antihypertensive that I'm on, um, used for hypertension and heart failure. And um, that hits a clock regulated target. And of course, when you take metoprolol, you get a prescription for it. It even says, take this in the early evening prior to prior to going to bed. So there's, there's some of this knowledge that's hard baked and people already know about it, but for the most part, most of these drugs are not giving with time of day indications. I mentioned this algorithm Cyclops, which is what if for whatever reason suddenly become extremely popular to uh, to duplicate. Um, but we developed this algorithm to try to get at rhythms in people. And um, so here's here's a, a part of the validation scheme that we had for, for Cyclops, which is um, where we had data sets where we knew the actual hour of death um, on the X axis, and we inferred the time of death on the Y axis, and I'll explain Cyclops in a minute, and we found very good agreement between the inferred time of death and the real time of death, particularly for strong, strong clock regulated factors like Chrono, which I mentioned, Reverb Alpha, which is the second gene on the list, VMAL clock, core oscillator components, and PER3, another core oscillator component. So I mentioned Cyclops. Uh, what we're really doing is using a very, I wouldn't say simple, but uh, an early form of machine learning where we're looking for structure and data. And so on the upper left-hand corner, there are two genes. These, this is real data, ELOV L3 and UBXN1. This is mouse data, where we have uh, ordered data where we've we, this is all data that we've collected from mice every two hours for two days. On the right-hand side, we've taken that same data and we've randomized it um, and, and plotted uh, each gene X versus Y. And, and so they have very different patterns when they're ordered or unordered. And you can see that upper left-hand corner, upper right-hand corner. But when you plot the data X versus Y, they have a very similar pattern that doesn't actually change. And it forms an ellipse or a, 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 a circle. And so if you just take ELOV L3 and UBXN1 and you plot them irrespective of time, just every time they're measured in, in a single sample, just plot them X versus Y, they form this circle. And if you randomize the data, they form the exact same circle, which of course they would have to because it's, it's, uh, it's their relationship. It's not the relationship of time. It's the relationship of these two genes that you're actually plotting. So all we're going to do is we're going to plot uh, principal components against each other. And when we see two PCs form a circle, we know that we've hit a periodic process and that the two principal components are slightly out of phase, half pi out of phase or so for a perfect circle. So we did this for uh, a whole bunch of human tissues. And so this is, these, these are our clock regulated genes in human liver. This is hundreds of human liver samples. These are typically biopsies that are taken from procedures. And you can see, for example, that clock itself, CRY1, DVP, TEF, which are clock output genes, all have this periodic pattern. But you can also see that drug targets like dopamine decarboxylase in the second row here have a very strong uh, circadian influence. Uh, PPAR alpha, for example, xanthine dehydrogenase, lower right-hand corner, uh, also have these extremely periodic patterns. But now we're not looking at mice in a laboratory, we're looking at people in the wild. Every dot here is a person. And um, 
And uh, in this particular slide, I think we have hundreds of hundreds of human human uh, volunteers. So I'm going to put forward that um, it's time for the consideration of time itself in precision medicine. We've spent tons of money and tons of effort on this idea of genetic precision and genetic testing and medication. And we even have some drugs that we test for clinically here in the hospital. So we test your genotype prior to giving the medication, but it's also, uh, it's also relevant to consider time of day in the circadian system and when to give what dosages of medications, the specific medications and what dosages. So just to sort of circle back here at, at Children's Hospital, um, we're the one of the largest, if not the largest children's hospital in the world. Um, we have 19,000 employees um, here in Cincinnati, which is a, a, a decently sized Midwest city, but um, a giant, a giant hospital and we're the, the tertiary and quaternary um, medical system for the region. Um, and, and here we're working on the circadian system with respect to our lighting systems, our operational procedures, for example, timing of feeding or when to dose medications, and then also leveraging the, the local patient population to tell us about unrecognized circadian disorders. So here's an example of the lighting research. This is work from Richard Lang and Jim Greenberg, who are a, a researcher and a physician here uh, that work on the NICU. We've just built a $640 million uh, neonatal intensive care unit, a NICU and PICU. And in the NICU and PICU, approximately 100 or so beds are outfitted with a lighting system that we can actually change not just the intensity of the light, not just how bright it is, but also the fluence of the light, what color lights are in the actual rooms. With the bone marrow transplant unit, we've conducted a, a randomized uh, trial of time-restricted time feeding, and this is work with Michelle Wong, Stella Davies, and Chris Standaway. Here was our sort of design there. Um, one of the things that happened when I first got here is, is Dave and I walked around the hospital and um, one of the groups we talked to were Stella and, and Chris. And um, we went down to the bone marrow transplant unit, which is very similar to an intensive care unit. So a, a very uh, uh, strictly controlled environment in the hospital. You have to gown up, you have to glove up, put your devices down, all that stuff to go in there because many of the patients don't have a strong immune function. And so they're they're at risk. They're, they're, they've either just had cancer or had an immune deficiency and they're getting a bone marrow transplant to correct or regrow their immune system. And, and, and so I was prepared for the terrible lighting systems, which there were in the hospital. But what I didn't realize was that they're fed uh, 24 7, 365 via uh, continuous enteral or parenteral nutrition, TPN, total parenteral nutrition. So when they get these procedures, they're, they're no longer able to digest food efficiently. And so um, they can actually uh, perish in the hospital if they're not fed properly. And, but, but what we've learned over the last several decades in, in the circadian field is that eating over long periods of time is probably not very beneficial to your health. And so here we have an at-risk population where we're feeding them over long periods of time, even though it's not oral feeding, it's feeding through a tube, but still we're feeding them, we're feeding them over long periods of time. So we decided to test the hypothesis that feeding over a shorter period of time would be helpful and we did a study where we looked at uh, about 20 individuals where we randomized people to um, enteral feeds, look at the upper right hand corner, looking at 24 seven feeding in, um, in, in versus 
beating over a 12 hour period. And what you can see is that the people that are able to eat the food orally, uh, starting at about week 15 or 16 or so, uh, are in the 12 hour group. So said another way, um, when you when you have a 12 hour window of, of nutrition, they're able to return to oral feeding sooner than people that have 24 hour fed systems. So uh, our hypothesis is this is because of internal circadian desynchrony. So because we have long periods of food, the internal organ systems are out of phase with each other, taking up nutrition less efficiently, metabolizing, catabolizing food uh, less efficiently. And when we're able to put a 12 hour a window on it, uh, they're able to recover quicker. Why is this important? Well, each day in the hospital is another day you're not with your friends and family, so that's bad. Also economically, it's more than $10,000 per day um, in a US hospital to recover from a bone marrow transplant. So this has enormous uh, societal uh, costs in addition to the humanity costs. My lab uh, studies the core clock at several different levels. Um, we use cellular models, upper left-hand corner. This is the U2OS osteosarcoma model, which is developed by my lab uh, many years ago. This is using a BMAL luciferase reporter. We also have PER2 luciferase reporters built in the same cell line. We also have other cell lines, NH3T3, MMHD3, et cetera. But there's no more than a handful of strongly oscillating cell types. Um, and But the good thing is we're able to manipulate them with both small molecules, but also RNAi. We've even done full genome screens of RNAi in 2009. Um, so 15 years ago, we were able to do whole, whole genome screening for uh, factors that influence the clock. Upper uh, left-hand corner, you can see this is Will Running Systems. Lower left-hand corner, this is work from David Welch, um, where they've engineered the PER2 luciferase mouse from Joe Takahashi's lab and done SCN imaging. And we have those animals and can do this type of imaging. In the lower right-hand corner, we have these piezoelectronic systems that measure mouth, mouse feeding and actually uh, uh, interpret the breathing patterns in terms of sleep stage. I don't, I'm not sure if I buy the sleep staging, but whether they're asleep or whether they're awake, that's probably pretty solid. I'm gonna put forward that what we know about the genetics of human sleep is pretty poorly understood. So this is kind of the sum of, of human knowledge here on sleep timing in humans. There's one, two, three, four, five, six genes that have been implicated, most by a single allele, um, a couple by more than one allele, uh, like DEC2. Um, but we've learned relatively little about sleep in humans, which is kind of odd when you think about it. Like, um, obviously, we spend on the order of 30, 35 billion dollars or so on on health related research in the United States every year. And, um, but surprisingly, a lot of that money is spent not on humans, but on model systems uh, that while extremely valuable, and I, I've taken you through this from the very beginning, from, from Kanapka and Benzer all the way to today, um, I, I certainly don't, I certainly don't want there to be a de-emphasis on model organism research, but how about some emphasis on research in humans? Because after all, uh, the NIH is not here to study uh, hamsters or arabidopsis. We're here to study health in people. It's also worked its way into popular culture. I uh, was born in Holland, but I grew up in North Florida. Um, so this is probably a uh, new to most of you, but there's a band, um, one of the many bands from North Florida, including Tom Petty, you probably heard of Tom Petty. Um, Laura, have you heard of Tom Petty? No, no. 
Uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, no, negative? No, huh, that's interesting. Okay, uh, but it's, it's uh, the circadian system found, found its way into popular culture. So this is a song which was originally recorded by, by Merle Haggard and, and covered by Leonard Skinner in, uh, in 1974 called Honky Tonk Nighttime Man. I'm a honky tonk nighttime man. I can't stand no light. I get my rest in the daytime and I do my running around at night. So this is a person which we would say has delayed sleep wake phase disorder. This is somebody that's not, not diurnal like most of us, but instead prefers to be awake during the sleeping phase at night. He had the blues this morning. He had the blues all day today, and he wishes a tornado would blow those blues away. Um, I've actually seen uh, several tornadoes. Uh, North Florida is, is uh, tornado prone, and I just have to say that's not a good idea. So you, you actually don't wish a tornado would blow your blues away. That's not, that's a good idea to get new blues or no blues at all because you're dead. Um, and then the most interesting phrase here is then my heart starts beating when the sun starts sinking low. So this person is actually recognizing that their heart rate and their blood pressure is clock controlled. And because they're delayed sleep wake phase disorder, it's occurring not before they, not before the morning, but in the in the late afternoon, early evening. Um, and so I think it's interesting that uh, even though we have a, a very scientific field that's made incredible strides in behavioral genetics, you could argue that the field of behavioral genetics came from the circadian system, that it's also been recognized by, uh, by in this case, um, this is probably uh, not of interest, but in, the, in this case, but, but by the Bakersfield country music establishment, which Merle Haggard and then later North Florida, Leonard Skinner recognized. Um, I highly recommend that you look the song up on YouTube. It's excellent. Uh, they have, there's two lead guitarists, which is interesting, but also, also excellent vocals by Ronnie Van Sant, um, who's uh, ethnically Dutch, um, but he grew up in, in Duval County, Florida. I'm going to also put forward that uh, that there's a huge opportunity in the genetic basis of sleep in children with respect to uh, with respect to adults. And this is work with my former colleague Carlos Prado, who's now at Northwestern. Tom Dye, uh, Dave again, who's in the office to the right of me, Kelly Byers, and Daniel Graf, who are sleep psychologists. Um, and, and that's because when an adult decides that they want to stay up until like 2 a.m., no one says you have to go to bed. But if a three-year-old um, can't get to sleep before 2 a.m., chances are uh, their parents are going to go to the pediatrician pretty soon because they don't want to go out, stay up until 3 a.m. I, I certainly don't want to. Um, at my age, I'm 11 is, is like a, a witching hour. I, I prefer to be in bed by 10 or before. I'm also gonna make the point that there are many genetic disorders that are accompanied by sleep problems. So I've just put, this is no, by no means comprehensive, just a, a list of, of diseases, syndromes, like Smith-Kingsmore syndrome, San Filippo, Smith-McGinnis, Angelman's, Rhett, uh, genetic epilepsy, Downs, autism, and delayed sleep-wake phase disorder, um, where a great proportion of the patients have have uh, sleep problems, many many times they're either poorly or or not treated at all. So this is an example. This is a healthy adolescent who was at the time fourteen years old. Uh, she went to to sleep at six a.m. and uh, woke up at four p.m. Um, which was problematic for going to school or interacting with the rest of uh, diurnal society. And over a six month period, Dave and her caretakers were able to use light therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, a phase shifting dose of melatonin and a hypnotic called clonidine to help this particular uh, patient resume a diurnal life and she was sleeping until 11 p.m. till 7 a.m., which is much more normal. 
and able to go to school. Everything was going great. She went off of clonidine um, and plopped back to nocturnal. She went back on clonidine and she was able to resume uh, di diurnality. And one of the things that our clinical teams do is stress that, you know, it, while you're going to school, when you're a teenager, or whatever, what have you, you can't you can't basically make school start at different hours. But when you get to be an adult, you can decide for yourself whether or not you want to work for Tokyo Desk in the New York Stock Exchange, or, uh, for example, be an ER doctor. And and so there's there's advantages to having these late late types. Um, that that may emerge later in life. And so when we were looking for candidate genes, one of the interesting findings was her the the genetics, her dad, her her paternal grandmother and her, and she all uh, had uh, polymorphisms in a gene called chrono, um, which is a gene our lab discovered, a non-canonical repressor of clock and female. And so we actually, made both chrono knockout mice, um, which is in the lower left-hand panel in black, where we looked at period length. And when you knock out one copy of chrono, you have an intermediate phenotype and you knock out two, two copies of chrono. You have a long, long period phenotype. And we also made a, a, a version, a mouse out of, of this particular allele of chrono and showed that these mice take about two extra hours to reach their peak loader, locomotor activity th than, a, than a normal mouse. We've also been working on uh, syndromic disorders like Smith-Kingsmore syndrome, which are caused by gain-of-function mutations in mTOR. mTOR is a, um, it, it's an important molecule that re regulates nutrient responses uh, amongst many other things in the body. Um, these particular patients have gain-of-function mutations in mTOR um, and have a, a wide range of a pretty serious uh, medical disabilities, including intellectual disability, developmental delay, megancephaly, and seizures. In fact, the kids that have passed from Smith-Kingsmore syndrome have all passed from epilepsy. Because it's a gain-of-function mutation in mTOR, the R in mTOR is rapamycin, which is an mTOR inhibitor. And so we decided to use mTOR. And uh, Carlos, who was about 50 meters from my office, uh, had dosed a patient. And um, the, the parent had noticed that, that uh, their sleeping changed when they gave this relatively high dose of rapamycin. And so they observed a sleeping pattern of about a week of good sleep, a week of okay sleep, a week of terrible sleep, and another week of okay sleep. And they said that each cycle lasted, lasted about 24 days or so. Now, when Dave and I saw that, we both were thinking, this looks like a, a delayed sleep-wake phase disorder patient um, and, and somebody whose tau is actually changing and they're chasing their clock. Their, cha their sleep is chasing the clock around the clock. For whatever reason, even though the family lives here in Cincinnati, they decided to write a physician in Montreal. Um, and then the physician in Montreal wrote uh, Mike Rosbosch, who's uh, in Boston. And then Mike wrote me, and then I gave the chart to Dave, and then Dave and Carlos talked. And uh, and so this, this uh, 2000 mile journey um, basically covered about 50 meters in the same building that I'm in right now um, with Dave uh, six feet over to the right. That's two meters in in uh, European system. And then Carlos, which is about 50 meters up that way. So 2,000 2, miles to go to go 50 meters. So that's not good, right? That's just, that's just, just us not talking. And one thing I would say is that we're now actually talking so that's a good, uh, that's a good thing. So we've in uh, similar research, we've gone on to show that the rap that the, the mTOR system is uh, strongly linked to the clock. There's physical connections between mTOR itself and, for example, PER2. Um, 
And we've shown both pharmacologically, upper left-hand corner, rapamycin, the mTOR inhibitor, middle panel, uh, shRNA is designed against mTOR, change period length, and uh, even the SCN system is altered by is altered by uh, at the mTOR system. And so it's it's not just changing period length, it's also influencing amplitude. So these are two core core sort of uh, principles of the circadian system. You, you know, you can have a very low amplitude rhythm and probably doesn't matter very much. Um, and you can have uh, high amplitude rhythms that are probably very important, et cetera, et cetera. So just like, just, just like with the patient with the chrono mutation, we've also made, uh, we, we've made avatar mice, basically mice with the same human polymorphisms. Uh, we, we've made those as well. And in this particular case, uh, this local patient, uh, Jack, who lives 10 miles away, um, ha had a 12 base pair deletion. And so we made a, a mouse with the same 12 base pair deletion in mTOR. And um, while they didn't have a circadian phenotype, what they did have was a hyperactivity phenotype, which is another, another trait of Smith-Kingsmore syndrome. So in this case, we were not able to model the circadian problems, but we were able to model the hyperactivity in mice. So here's our sort of treatment model for SKS. Um, you're basically trying to dial in the appropriate mTOR activity amount. And uh, we think we have ideas on how to do that. We've made other alleles, something like 15 or so alleles of mTOR and SKS. And I was hoping there'd be one dose that would work for all of them, but it doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, I think there might be dose finding studies required for every patient. So I'm gonna finish up with just a couple of you know, uh, vagaries. Um, so uh, genetic testing is uncovering the link between vari genetic variation and physiology. There are thousands of rare diseases. Um, the vast majority are variants of unknown or uncertain significance and building um, cellular and animal models can be a powerful approach to try to learn about them and potentially help treat patients. The most important slide, this is the sort of research team, Gong Wu, who's now in the genetics laboratory uh, right across the street. Wai Wai Li, who's now doing a postdoc at Merck. Jiffin, who's my lab manager, is outside. Rochelle is a neurologist and um, she has a, a desk in the lab, but is also a, a attending physician here, Sam, who's down the hall, and Dave Smith, who was in the office next door to me, and he's a sleep boarded otolaryngologist. So Dave and Rochelle are sort of the medical, you know, two thirds of the medical team along with Tom Dye, and the rest of the team is sort of more focused on, on the research side. And with that, I'll take any questions.